This is a GIS new, News Hour for Thursday, November 10, 2011. I am Abigail McIntyre. Coming up, Tourism Minister says there's need for a regional arrangement with airlines regarding subsidies. ECCU Monetary Council says high-quality bidders have come forward to purchase the traditional business of BICO and a call for men to take their rightful place in society. Details to these and other stories after the break. loan scheme of the Ministry of Housing, Lands and Community Development benefits you as citizens by providing loans for you to improve your home. Remember that this scheme survives on a revolving fund, so for others to benefit, you must honor your repayment commitments. The Ministry of Housing, Lands and Community Development therefore encourages you to honor your obligation so that the lives of all citizens can be improved. Payment arrangements can be adjusted or modified to reduce any possible burdens. For further information, please contact the Ministry of Housing, Lands and Community Development on phone numbers 440-2103 or 440-1439. Remember, we all depend on each other for national development. Do you really want to save on the cost of posting? Grenada Postal Corporation is the answer. We offer convenience, online tracking, reliability, on-time delivery, and of course, on beatable prices, on express parcels and registered mailing. Ask about your online visa application and notification by email service. Grenada Postal Corporation, a member of the UPU, the world's oldest network. Send, receive, delivered. Welcome back. Grenada's Tourism Minister Peter David says ministers of civil aviation in the Caribbean region need to sit and work out a regional arrangement with airlines with regards to subsidies. His comment was contained in an interview during his participation in the world travel market in London. Minister David says the reality is that without subsidies, they will not get airlines and believes that increasing tourism arrivals will ensure these subsidies are reduced. A small island, it's, it's difficult. I mean, Grenada spends about $10 million a year on subsidies. We have to find a way to, 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 to do something about that. And we have found that uh, you know, if we can increase our tourism arrivals, if we can uh, move to the point where the, the airlines are making simply not just flying, but flying profitably, then we can move in the direction of reduction of subsidies. So, you know, we've had good discussions with the airlines. The airlines are, 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 are you know, continue to work with us, but we must find a way to, to have the airlines fly without subsidies. And I think the only way to do that is to make it profitable for them by increasing the arrivals in the region, which means increased marketing and, and, and other, uh, other, other ways in which we can do that. You say $10 million a year? $10 million a year. Is that US dollars? Uh, no, that is That's EC dollars. EC dollars, uh, dollars a about year. About 3 million or so. Yes, about 3, 4 million US dollars a year, simply to pay the airlines to fly, which is, is quite large. It's a lot small economy. Economy. Very small economy. Grenada is a very small economy, 100,000 people, uh, you know, 1,500 rooms. It's, it's a small, it's a large, large amount to be paid just for airlines to fly. On the subject of LIAT, the tourism minister says despite criticisms about the airline in terms of efficiency and late arrivals, LIAT remains one of the best assets in the Eastern Caribbean. He maintains that it must be treated as a public utility and not simply as a business. 
fact is that there are some unprofitable routes that we need to move people around the Caribbean. And, and in order to do that, if we were to simply say to Leon, or to any airline for that matter, fly where it's profitable, we find that there, there's some routes to be removed. So yes, I advocate subsidization for Leon. I advocate more government involvement for Leon, simply because it is a public utility, utility and like water and electricity and other public utilities, we all subsidize. So we expect the Grenada government at some point to say, I, I have advocated within our government that we should get on the table with Leah. Not only Barbados, St. Vincent, uh, and Be a shareholder. I Absolutely. I have advocated that. Of course, these are difficult economic times and, and governments are trying as much as possible to reduce expenditure. Uh, but I've said to my government and I've said to the public, we must not treat Leah simply as an expenditure. It is an investment, not only in tourism, because of the importance of regional tourism, something we must not uh, 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 minimize. Regional tourism is extremely important, but also because of the movement of people uh, within the region. Regional integration is one of our priorities. That is why we have CARICOM, that is why we have the OECS, that is why we have all the regional integrations. We cannot speak about regional integration if we do not speak about regional transport, if we do not speak about moving people around the region so that integration doesn't become a governmental integration, it becomes people integration. And LIA, LIA is critical in that regard. Of course, I'm not suggesting that one should not look at the, the uh, inefficiencies of LIA, that not, one should not look to the restructuring of LIA. All of that must be looked at. Uh, but at the same time, we must look at it with a view to improving it rather than saying, let us bring in competition to remove LIA. Of course, competition is always good, but competition not with the purpose of removing LIA and bringing in an airline that will eventually, can eventually increase the fares and reduce flights so that is our position, my position on it. The Monetary Council of the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union says a number of high-quality bidders have come forward to purchase the traditional business of the British American insurance company Bico, and the council expects to complete transaction within the first half of next year. The council says while it had indicated that the complex transaction would take six to nine months to complete, the need to obtain regulatory approvals for the sale of the business across nine territories was a process unlikely to be completed by the end of this year. The final phase of the process of selling Baiko's traditional business was expected to be completed in the first half of 2012. The council disclosed that it was seeking a legal advice on the best way to affect the transfer of the traditional business across nine separate countries among other issues. It said that the Eastern Caribbean governments and the judicial management team handling BICO had worked together to identify some of the key technical and practical challenges involved in affecting this transfer. According to the statement, actuaries have been engaged to undertake more detailed analysis of the portfolio and the financial contribution needed to recapitalize BICO's traditional business. For a start, the judicial managers of BICO have begun legal proceedings against CL Financial in Trinidad and Tobago as they seek to recover 49.5 million U.S. dollars owed by CL Financial to BICO as part of their work in rationalizing BICO's liabilities. In other news, staff and students at the Holy Cross Roman Catholic School were given some assurance that things will soon get better for them. Prime Minister the Honorable Tillman Thomas gave word to students that he will ensure that they have adequate facilities for recreation. And Education Minister Senator Frank Bernadine reassured staff that the ministry continues to work on ensuring they get a new building in which to operate. Both Prime Minister Thomas and Minister Bernadine were on another of the Prime Minister's school visit activities. On Thursday, they stopped at the Holy Cross RC School and St. Giles Anglican in the parish of St. Andrew. After a warm welcome by staff and students at the Holy Cross Roman Catholic School, Prime Minister Tillman Thomas spent some time speaking to the youngsters about taking their education seriously and preparing themselves for the future. It was after his speech a student stood and brought to his attention the dilapidated condition of the playing field in the community, which prohibits them from holding recreational activities. In response, Mr. Thomas assured the student that he will address the matter, noting the importance of sporting activities in any school or community. We see um, sports as very important uh, for our young people.
I mean, sports help build character, help you to be disciplined. It brings about teamwork among our young people. I was not aware of the deficiencies in the playing field up here. But what I know is that the Minister of Education is really committed and dedicated to upgrading play fields in Grenada. And I'll bring it to his attention. Uh, we've been, if you go wrong the island, you'll see most of the play fields are properly looked after. So I'll bring it to his attention. I know the ministry would do something about it because it is the policy of the Ministry of Sports uh, to upgrade all the playing fields in, uh, in the island. And as you see, uh, Munich is known for cricket and uh, we are trying to um, promote and give support to those who are involved in, the, in, in cricket. So again, I'll bring it to the attention of the Minister and the Ministry of Sports and we'll see what could be done to improve the facilities up here in Munich. As it stands now, the school is housed on church grounds. The ministry has been working to find a new location for the school to erect a new building. A teacher at the school inquired about the matter, requesting an update. Education Minister Senator Frank Bernadine responded. There was a long and heated debate, as you are well aware, of which location, because we thought of continuing where we are here, we looked at the fact, the close proximity to the river, and then there was a very strong lobby to go back to where the old building was. We brought in the engineers who looked and said they were of a different opinion. One set said, it should be fine. Earthquakes are a reality of this part of the world. It's no more of a threat here in Munich than it is in um, the heart of St. George's or wherever such um, cracks may occur or occasional quakes may occur. So one line of thought said it could go back there. And we got a strong feeling from the community that they would like it right back there. We got an equally strong opinion that no, it does not make sense looking at those big cracks, putting back a building where it was before, you're being foolhardy, you can't go onto that land because the same thing is going to happen again, we must learn from the experience. So there was a difference of opinion which we are very conscious of. And just for the time, I suppose, when the decision making would have to have been finalized, we heard the delay in getting the funding, so that sort of shelved the issue somewhat. But um, that's why I cannot tell you this morning what was the final outcome of that dialogue. But I will tell you that certainly the opinion of the people of the village and the community of Munich are a critical part of that decision. And also the people at the school, because we are very much, um, we always have to bear in mind the people who are living the experience must influence uh, must also influence what happens as a final decision. But we will have to follow what is engineeringly correct. After the visit to Holy Cross, the Prime Minister and his team headed for St. Giles Anglican Primary School. There, Senator Bernadine was asked by a student when they would be getting a new school facility. The current structure, according to the school's principal, is infested with termites and leak when there is heavy rainfall. Minister Bernadine says she cannot give a specific date, but assure them that they are on the list for assistance. I'm anticipating that this building could still be used, maybe as your auditorium or whatever, but that you will get additional buildings to um, incorporate all the space that you need. All right? So that is what we have in mind for St. Giles. We're not planning to throw this building down as far as I know, but we're planning to enhance and add so that you will have enough space to carry out the classes and courses that you need to do here. Now, the date for that delivery, I can't give you either because this is, um, these are all loans that we have requested and we've put forward in order of priority. I could tell you that there are schools ahead of you because some schools are in worse condition, believe it or not. And I know that you are struggling. I can look around and I can see you are in one school hall for a start. So we are aware of your difficulties, but in order of sequence, as we get the loans and the grants approved, I can assure you that we are going to systematically address the issue of schools right around the island. If men do not set a standard, there will be nothing for young people to follow. That is the warning from Mr. Tim Beyer, member of the Anglican Church Men's League. The Men's League of the Anglican Church will be hosting an Anglican Men's Conference at the National Stadium next week Friday and Saturday. 
It will be held under the theme, Rekindling the Spirit of God in Men for Discipleship. Mr. Byers says there is a lack of real role models in Caribbean societies, and they are hoping the conference will help men to take their rightful place. There's a fashion fad, um, which, which, I mean, to me, suggests that they, and I mean, it's, it's a sort of disrespect in my view, um, the kind of way they dress. Um, you can't demand respect when you, when you, when you, you, you know, wear your pants where you could hardly walk mm. and, and, and things like that. And I think it, it, it makes us look like jokers. And I think we need to, um, we need to, to be serious. And we need to, you know, take an active role and, and look positive. And we're trying to say, well, if we ourselves as men don't set a standard or don't, you know, um, well, set a standard basically, um, there will be nothing for the youth to follow. Right? Because so we need our influence. Is the what influence. Is. So, so this is what we are trying to do: do things, um, and and so that we can influence the young ones, and so on. Because the young ones are our future, and if we don't look after them, or if we don't train them in the right way, and if we don't set examples, then the, the young ones would 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 follow the bad ways. If they, you know, they would be on the wayside, and and so on. While he says women are showing themselves to be the more promising of the sexes, Mr. Byers says there is still hope when they consider the problems of other countries. When you hear um, of the problems um, that exist in other countries regarding men and, and so on, um, I would say, I mean, in spite of our problems, Grenada is, is, is still paradise. I mean, but it motivates you still. I mean, when you, you hear of the problems of people, especially Guyana, um, you have men reaching out to fellas in the interior of Guyana. And I mean, there's no road to go there. People have to swing on branches. Um, the houses, they have no floors. The people live in, you know, and you have to eat what they eat and, you know, and so on. And in order to minister to them. And when you hear problems in Belize, and of course, we always hear problems in Jamaica and what happens and so on, and the crime rate and thing. I mean, and you compare it, you, you have to be thankful. But at the same time, it does not mean that we must be complacent. Okay. Right? I think we, we still have a lot to do. We still have a lot to do. Bayer made a call for people to sponsor a young man so that he can participate in the conference. We are asking the men from the various parishes to sponsor um, a, a young man to, to come to the conference. Now, there's a fee for the conference because, of course, um, the fee has to cover for meals, um, right. for stationery, for the renting of the place, and, and a number of other things. So we have been asking the various groups across the island to at least sponsor a young man or, or two. Let them come in. And, of course, um, we are not isolating the women. I mean, there are experiences where, you know, a, a woman visited, and when it was time for observers to speak, um, the woman gave her contribution, and we are very much appreciative of, of that. So we're not isolating, you know, the women, because we know that women also play a very active role, and perhaps they can give us ideas that, that we could work with. The Ministry of Youth is calling for public participation in its next major event on the Youth Month activities, a health fair. This Saturday from 10 in the morning, the Alston George Park in St. Mark will be flooded with tents and booths set up by organizations ready to disseminate information to people. There will be free screening and testing along with other medical services on that day. Youth Service and Leadership Coordinator with the Ministry, Jacqueline Alexis, says it's a family event and all is invited. We have um, several other organizations joining with us on this. We have NADMA coming along. We have the um, Red Cross. Uh, we also have the police coming in with drug avoidance, their drug avoidance unit. And in addition to that, we will also have diabetes testing, um, blood pressure, and also breast 
chest checks for for the young women everybody is welcome i mean yes it is a youth health fair but that doesn't exclude uh, you know the rest of the, the the general public i mean we're all young at heart so you know come along we're in your area come along we have invited and we'll be bringing along some youth groups from across the country but we really are encouraging people in st mark's to come out and and see what's going on and participate and um, you know get get yourself checked as well Youth Month began on November 1st with youth parliamentary debates in three parishes. There was also an ecumenical service in Lassages playing field last week. Ms. Alexis says things are progressing and she was particularly pleased with the debates. I've been absolutely overwhelmed by the participation of the young people, the commitment and dedication that has been shown. They, you know, they really have done their work. They've researched their subject matter. They've really, really participated. Um, all of them so far. There's been um, three in this month. I mean, we've been doing youth parliament throughout the year, as you know. But, the, but in it is a focus of this youth month that we are having. Um, having it as, as a central focus to the month. So we've had three so far, um, which has been St. John's and St. St. Mark's, St. David and St. George's, and St. Andrew's and St. Patrick's. So it's been the three zones. We've had those. There's one coming up on Tuesday next week in, Saint, in, um, in Karakou. So they're having theirs. And then, um, if you like, the best of the best from all of those will participate in the National Youth Parliament, which will be held on the 23rd of November in, um, in Grenville, in the Deluxe the uh, Cinema in Grenville. And so that will be the national one. And um, we're very, very much looking forward to this. The subject for this will be tourism, because, you know, we're, we're currently in Tourism Awareness Month. So we're kind of partnering with the, with the Ministry of Tourism on this and the um, resolution will be tourism related. So we look at, you know, the impact of tourism on the country and what it does. And so that will be the, their debating subject. And um, we're really, really excited about it. Youth Month is being celebrated on the theme Youth Called to Action to Create a Better Tomorrow. You're watching the GIS News Hour more after the break. that was never chopped down to make a crutch that was never needed by a child who never got polio because a vaccine was never in short supply thanks to people whose compassion wasn't either you can help rotary end polio now learn how you can help at rotary.org slash end polio rotary humanity in motion Sometimes, the simplest joys in life can be the most rewarding. For quality sexual and reproductive health care services, make the GPPA your next stop. Visit our offices at St. George's and Grenville. Call 440-3341 or 442-5442 for more information. The Grenada Planned Parenthood Association, promoting healthy living. Welcome back to the broadcast. The Ministry of Agriculture is searching for ways to assist the traffickers in Grenville who sell their goods to neighboring Trinidad and Tobago. As Jimmy Campbell reports, the aim is to enhance trade relations between both countries. The agricultural produce trade from Grenada to Trinidad and Tobago still provides an important market avenue for local farmers. A typical Tuesday afternoon on the port of Grenville sees tons of golden apples, soursops, plantains and other Grenadian produce on their way to the neighboring country via schooners. The Ministry of Agriculture is aware of the important role this trade plays in providing market for farmers' produce 
and earning foreign exchange. It is therefore considering ways to work along with traffickers of agricultural products and address their concerns. The intention is to seek ways to better organize the operation to the benefit of all involved and the agricultural sector in general. Executive member of the Grenville Traffickers Association, Robert Stroud, alias Barber, says this operation makes an important contribution to Grenada's agriculture since no commodity is left out. I mean, all agriculture produce that is growing in Grenada goes to Trinidad. Everything goes to Trinidad. Every, every living thing. Name it, like you, you see. As you can see for yourself, you see Sapodilla. Well, Sapodilla right now is not, in, is not in season. But everything that is in season goes to Trinidad. Mr. Stroud says the Trinidad trade carried out by the trafficker is a most reliable avenue for farmers. Every week, you don't know, maybe or perhaps. The Ministry of Agriculture is serious about promoting or supporting every initiative that has the potential to bring benefits to the farming community and the country's agricultural sector. From the Public Relations and Communication Department of the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries, I am Jamie Campbell. Thank you, Jamie. Grenada will join the rest of the world this weekend to remember and honor those who served in the two world wars or is observed in countries to remember the members of their armed forces who died in the line of duty since. Remembrance Day or Armistice Day is observed in Commonwealth countries to remember the members of their armed forces who died in the line of duty since World War I. Remembrance Day is observed on 11 November to recall the official end of World War I on that date in 1918. Hostilities formally ended at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918 with the German singing of the armistice. In Grenada, the day will be observed on Sunday, the nearest Sunday to the 11th of the month. Mrs. Lauren Gray, Vice President of the Grenada Legion of the RCEL, spoke about Sunday's service on the GIS Spice Morning. To Sunday, the police band, mm -hmm. beautiful parade, mm -hmm. it starts on the carnage. It, it starts on the carnage at mm. the um, central police station or the, or the fire station, station. if you like. Right and goes up to the Cenotaph and Botanical Gardens and uh, so that they have to have march off mm -hmm. from the Carinage. And then from the, when after the, the um, service, short service, then we again march down to the, the fire station. Good. And His Excellency the Governor General. His Excellency, the Prime, Minister. Prime Minister, Cabinet yeah. members, yeah. whoever Diplomats. is able to come. Yes, we have quite a few this year, right. visiting ones as well. And the, the reeds are laid by those who uh, would like to participate. Uh, most, all of it, the diplomats, in fact, and of course, um, the honorary councils, right. people like that. Mrs. Grace says it is important that young people are taught the importance of our history. We distribute poppies to all the schools, as I said, and Good. business places. And we find that the, um, the schools do quite well, at least some of the schools. You know, others sort of leave the boxes of poppies there and sell a few and that's it. But in fact, what we would like them to do and what we would like you as the media to sensitize them to the fact that they have to, to have to tell the children, that's why we prepare this, to let the children know. Because I think that the children, the ones who are coming up, they are future and they must know, they must not let this die. They must know what has happened in, in right. their, their ancestors' time, Good. you know, so as, as we do history about right. the Indians, the Amerindians, the Arawaks, mm. the same way they should know about our people who have fought in the wars. Media workers from all sections of the field will be taught how they can protect their work and know their responsibility in accordance with the new Copyright Act of 2011. The Eastern Caribbean Collective Organization for Music Rights, which is headed locally by Dr. Peter Radix, will stage a workshop on Saturday, November 12, for all media practitioners. The session, which starts at 9 and goes until midday, 
will be held at the Red Cross Conference Room. It will be facilitated by former Solicitor General Mrs. Anandi Trotman Joseph. Dr. Radix wants as many practitioners possible to attend Saturday's workshop as each media worker is affected under the Copyright Act. It's particularly important for media personnel to be aware because they themselves will be impacted by the legislation. Uh, for one example, um, there are certain works that many journalists do that is protected by copyright. Uh, they need to be aware of that. Articles that they write, for example, uh, many broadcasts that media houses do are protected by copyright. So they themselves, um, workers need to be aware as to what their rights and obligations are. Apart from their own personal um, involvement, we need for media workers to be knowledgeable about copyright um, because we would want the media persons to help in increasing or improving public awareness. Now, in order to improve public awareness, the journalists, the media persons themselves have to be aware as to what rights and obligations persons have under the act. So it's for their own personal uh, development, growth and development, and also to assist uh, the copyright organization in spreading the word, in informing and educating the general public about copyright. Dr. Radix and his team have held similar sessions with other key groups affected under the act. He believes people are slowly warming up to the issues surrounding the piece of legislation and what it represents. Little by little, it's a slow process. What we are finding is that some persons are gravitating towards it, others are sort of stepping back and want to take a second look, they're not certain of certain things. And we believe the more knowledge people have, they'll be more comfortable, more confident. And that's why we have this consultation, so that people can be aware of the contents of the act, they can ask questions and um, be more informed. And so they'll be more comfortable. Um, it's the whole concept of intellectual property and copyright is relatively new to many persons in Grenada. So, like with anything new, uh, persons um, may have a certain reluctance or they're not quite sure how to treat with the subject matter. So we want you to be as comfortable as with any other subject that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's the, the overall objective of the consultation is to make people aware and comfortable knowing their rights, their obligations, but also the rights and obligations of all the parties um, with whom the act is concerned. Next Saturday, November 19, another consultation will be held on the Sister Isle of Karakou. The Board of Tourism there requested that a session be held at the Hills Bar Resource Center. Something tells me that that session in Karakou will probably be one of the better attended sessions. Um, we were getting good feedback, meaning people are asking for it, yes, which is not necessarily the case in St. George's, in Grenada. So um, the fact that people are asking for it, it says, hey, we want to know more. And so we will facilitate them by going to Karakou on the 19th, Saturday the 19th. So we want people to look out uh, be aware, put that on your calendar, um, Saturday the 19th at the Resource Center in Hillsboro at 4.30 and um, we can talk all about copyright. And we need musicians, DJs, promoters. If you use music or if you own copyright music, meaning if you're an owner, you're a writer, a, a composer, a musician, a, a vocalist, a back vocalist, um, if you're a promoter, if you're a DJ, you work in a radio station, anything to do with music, um, you would want to be there because, again, you would want to be knowledgeable. Through an open letter to Chancellor of the United Kingdom, George Osborne, a coalition of more than 30 American travel industry organizations has challenged the air passenger duty, the APD, leveled by the British government on travelers to and from the UK.
They described it as excessively high and counterproductive and urged the government to abandon plans to raise the APD in 2012. The letter issued this week and signed by over 30 leading U.S. travel industry organizations called the APD nothing more than a tax grab for the purpose of reducing the UK's budget deficit and charged that it unfairly penalized the airlines and their customers. Instead, the organizations, including the Air Transport Association, which is the largest and oldest airline trade association, called for the UK authorities to not only abandon plans to increase the APD rate, but instead to begin a progressive reduction of the tax. That's news. Sports is next with Trevor Fleets. Stay with us. I know when I see the God that get it sign, I won't be judged. So I don't feel stress or guilty about protecting myself. I can buy condoms without any pressure. The L on block sign, it means this is a cool place where me and my girl can get condoms and we can be safe every time. I like the fact that they are looking out for me because I'm trying to look out for myself. Before, I used to be very nervous and now everything's cool. If you spend two hours in a room where someone's smoking, you'll inhale the equivalent of four cigarettes. My dad shared an office with a chain smoker, eight hours a day, five days a week, for more than ten years. Not surprisingly, he died of lung cancer. I've had enough of secondhand smoke. Have you? Australia and South Africa dismissed on the second day of an absorbent first test in Johannesburg as 23 wickets tumble. Project officer of the WICB, Roy Lewis, shares his experience with fans after a year on the job. Hard Rock win the 2011 GFA Handicap Soccer Championship, and the action resumes Thursday evening in the National Under 23 Basketball Championship at the Caronite Complex. This is another GI Sports. Hello, I'm Trevor Thwaites. First off, cricket. It's been an absorbing second day as 23 wickets fell in the first test between Australia and South Africa in Johannesburg. Australia started the day on 214 for 8, battled to reach 284, with skipper Michael Clark scoring 151. Dales turned back the 5 for 55 from 20 overs, and there were three wickets apiece for Mohan Markle and Vernon Philander. High drama followed that South Africa crashed for 96 in their first innings. Graham Smith top scored with 37, and there were 18 from Jack Rudolph and 16 from Hashim Amler. Shane Watson on a man, the home team, with a capture of 5 for 15 from seven overs, and received good support from Harris, who picked up 4 for 33 from 10.3 overs. The action then bubbled over as Australia crashed for a mere 47 second time around. Vernon Villander had them on the run with the outstanding figures of 5 for 17 from 7 overs. Uh, he was ably assisted by Mohan Mark, who picked up 3 for 9 from 6 overs. Australia slipped to 21 for 9 at one stage, but lost the, but the last wicket stand of 26 between Peter Siddle, 12, and Nathan Lyon, 14, saw them go past the lowest score in Test cricket, 26 made by New Zealand against England in 1955. South Africa chasing 236 for victory, closed the day on 81 for 1, with Graham Smith not out on 36 and Hashim Amler on 29. Jack Rudolph is the man out for 14. The game will certainly end on the third day after Australia scored 284 and 47. South Africa replying with 96 and 81 for 1. In more cricket news, all-rounder Dwayne Smith will lead the West Indies A in two digital 
2020 games this weekend at the Bush Ukraine playing field in St. Lucia against their counterparts from Bangladesh. Smith, who cracked a century on his first on his test debut against South Africa in 2004, has played 10 test matches and 10 2020 internationals, along with 77 one internationals. The 30-man squad includes just three players who have never played for the West Indies senior team, Trinidadians Jason Mohammed and Samuel Badri, and Ghanese Berasami Pamal. All of the other 10 members of the squad have played international cricket, with Grenadian fast bowler Neelan Pascal and Smith being the two to have played test cricket. The squad is Dwayne Smith, the captain, Samuel Badri, Christopher Banwell, Miles Bascom, and Kuma Bonna, uh, Carlos Braffitt, Johnson Charles, Gary Mathurin, Neelan Pascal, Verasami Pamal, Christma Santoki, and Devon Thomas. Still with cricket, former Grenada and West Indies player Roy Lewis says that he is enjoying his stint as project officer with the West Indies Cricket Board, the WICB. Lewis, who has just completed the first year on the job in Antigua, is one of the officials entrusted with the task of planning and effectively executing youth cricket tournaments at the under-15, under-17, and under-19 age categories. The former West Indies player says that he's enjoying the demanding job. You engage the, the territorial boards, you engage, you know, you do everything from your end mm -hmm. to start the process. Um, beginning with the, the playing conditions for the tournament. And, you know, you take it from there and you go forward until you, you have a complete tournament when you do the end of tournament report. Yeah. So, you know, you have the sole responsibility of planning and executing that tournament. You enjoyed it? Very much so. It involves cricket. Right. You know, I, I get to, to travel to, to all the countries that I've been when, when I used to play. Mm -hmm. I get to meet all the people, you know, the same set of people. Right you know, and get to see the up-and-coming West Indian stars. After 18 years on the field of play, Lewis says that it's been uh, a little difficult adjusting to administer administering the game. He believes that it's more difficult to administer the cricket than to play. <laughs> I used to believe, and a lot of cricketers believe, that the hardest part of the game is out there. Right. But for me, the, hardest, the most difficult part is to plan it and to make sure that everything goes well when you're in the execution stage. And the amount of logistics that has to go into getting a tournament to play from start to finish, it's unbelievable. Um, from being on the field of play, I never even thought that all these different things you would have to do to, to, to ensure that a cricket match comes out well. And now that I'm seeing it, I have more respect for the game of cricket. The former Grenada captain gives us an insight as, as to the work involved. For example, the sending of a team, a youth team, to a tournament in Sharjah. For example, if you have to send an uh, under-19 team to Dubai right. for two weeks, mm -hmm. I have 20 names in front of me. Right. And I have to ensure that they are all spelled correctly. You have to be in touch with the selectors to, to be sure that it, you have to engage the Dubai Embassy um, to get all the logistics, to get the visas. You, you have to look after the flights, um, British Airways, you, you, you know. So you have emails coming to you back and forth, <laughs> 25, 26 emails sometimes on a, on a given morning to reply to before you start your day okay. to just plan this, you know, this trip. And that's only a short trip. And then you have some of these international tools that you have in. And then you, you have to actually sometimes go to the tournament to explain to the people. You are actually preparing the playing conditions for those tournaments. You have to present yourself there before the tournament to explain the playing conditions to the, man, to the match referees, the umpires, the captains, the managers. Lewis says that he has learned a lot from the director of cricket, Tony Howard, who is a perfectionist. He wants you to get the job done and get it done properly. Okay. So he pushes you. You never should be late. You never should be, you know, your, your, your work must add up and you must meet your deadlines. 
So I, I've had this told to me many, many times because they realize that I came from a cricketing background mm -hmm. where sometimes a lot of things don't go right. As cricket as you, you, you say come to practice for two o'clock, you reach half right. past three and it's fine, you know. <laughs> but in this environment, you mm -hmm. cannot, you cannot do that because the tour might be late or, you know, some mishap might take place where it caused a problem later on down the road. Project officer of the WICB, Roy Lewis, the former Grenada, Wooden Islands, and West Indies player. In football, St. Patrick's Old Foot had Rock at the 2011 Heineken Soccer Champions of the Spice Owl. They finished the 18 match program on 39 points, one more than second place Lime Paradise. Despite losing their last encounter 1 0 to Function All United, they did enough to win the event. New MGBSS, who were around the bottom of the table, after the first round, produced a big second round display. They finished third on 34 points. Former Grenada captain Antonino Nixon, who took charge of the team after retiring from international football, was mainly responsible for the big turnaround of the outfit. Queen's Park Rangers, too, who were also uncertain in the first round, rebounded well in the second half of the season to finish fourth on 28 points. Meanwhile, Boca Juniors and Paliso played in the Premier League next year after performing brilliantly in the first division. Boca Juniors won the event amassing 50 points while Police finished second on 48 points. Boca Juniors and Police will be promoted to the Premier Division while there is a relegation for South Stars and Ball Dogs. The GFA says that Willis Youths, Foot Golf, and Alaska Spartans will be demoted to the second division next season. Hard Rock will earn $30,000 for winning the Premier League, while $20,000 are earmarked for Lion Paradise, who finished second, and another $15,000 for third place GBSS. Attractive, uh, attractive cash prizes are also earmarked for the top teams in the first division. In more football news, Magdalene College on Thursday reached the final of the girls' division of the Republic Bank Rice Start Youth Football Tournament. They beat St. Mark's secondary three goals to one in penalty kicks after they had played to a one-all draw. Magdalene College will meet the winner of the other semi-final fixture next week between St. Joseph's Convent St. Andrew and St. Mark's secondary. In matches yesterday, SAS defeated GBSS two goals to nil in their clash at Pearls while St. Mark's defeated St. Rose by a similar scoreline, two goals to nil, in their duel at the Computer Spark in Guava in the Junior Boys Division. The action continues on Friday with a play in the Senior Boys Competition when Happy Hill Secondary tackled St. Mark's Secondary at the Alton George Park and uh, Presentation Brothers College PBC meeting Magna College. And finally, this evening, uh, taking some news of, uh, uh, let's see, it's news of uh, basketball. The National Under-23 Championship continues Thursday evening on the Carinage Court. One game will be contested, the clash between the elites of the Outer Grand Dance and the TA Marshall Community College. All the action is from 5, uh, 5 30 in the afternoon should have been on by now. There's also more action on Friday when Bain and Sons Eagles tackles tornadoes, also from 5.30 on the Carinage Sporting Thanks. Complex. That's sports. I'm Trevor Thwaites. a message from the Ministry of Works, Physical Development and Public Utilities. The Ministry of Works would like to remind the public that the roadside along the Morris Bishop Highway was declared a no vending area in 2010 by the Ministry of Works and the Royal Grenada Police Force. A no vending sign was erected in the area opposite to the McIntyre Brothers business place to bring it to the attention of the public. The traffic department of the RGPF had said the highway is not to be used for selling of any items whatsoever, as this can cause accidents along the highway. A number of billboards on the highway is also an issue for the traffic department, and persons erecting these signs must first seek permission from the physical planning unit. The instability and closeness of the billboards to the corners can cause serious problems for road users. 
A sign with the words no vending without permission was also posted at the area commonly known as Wall Street in Grand Dance. All vending permission is granted by the Ministry of Works through the vending officer. For more information, call the Ministry of Works at 440-2271 or 440-2272. The preceding was a message from the Ministry of Works, Physical Development and Public Utilities. Start your morning with the Government Information Service. Tune in to GIS Spice Morning, Mondays through Fridays, starting 6.45 a.m. Spice up and brighten your morning with an informative television show with guests from a broad cross-section of society. You too can be a part of our Spice Morning. Call us at 440-2061 or email gisgrenada at yahoo.com. GIS TV Channel 12, your best choice for educational and entertaining television. Thank you, Trevor, with this evening's sports segment. Before we go, here's a recap of the stories making it in the headline. Tourism Minister says there is need for a regional arrangement with airlines regarding subsidies. ECCU Monetary Council says high-quality bidders have come forward to purchase the traditional business of BICO and a call for men to take their rightful place in society. On behalf of the entire team here at the Government Information Service, I am Abigail McIntyre. Thank you for joining us. Watching the Government Information Service, channels 12 and 22.